Hello, welcome to Buckle Up. My name's Jasper and today I'm driving a car that needs no introduction. But you might need a refresher on the price because a decent example of a Defender will set you back around the 20k mark and even a drivable one is going to be a minimum of about £10,000. So why is that? Why have prices gone so high for Defenders? Let's try and find out. We'll start, as always, at the front, and the Defender has probably the most recognisable front-end styling that you will see on any road, definitely in Great Britain and possibly the world. It's an incredibly square design at the front and has remained largely unchanged since 1958. These lamps here have always been separate and the Defender's known feature with its grille is these horizontal slats instead of the classic Jimny or Jeep Wrangler vertical slats on the grille. And it's an incredibly butch design, just listen to that, it's, that's nearly enough part of the chassis. The bonnet is another iconic piece of design at the front of the Defender, with it being stepped up from the rest of the panels at the front of the car. Now, that is actually quite handy because it means you have somewhere to lean when you are working on the engine when it breaks down. I've just popped the bonnet, meaning we can take a look at the mighty 2.5 litre four-cylinder turbo diesel engine, which is called the 300 in this particular model, and we can see what creates the massive 111 horsepower and 264 newton metres of torque that this particular model has. Another classic design feature are these vents underneath the windscreen. They remained on the Defender up until 2007 and they're very functional. They are just a hole underneath the windscreen that lets air flow into the cabin. Ah, uh, British engineering. <laughs> At the side of the Defender you can see the continuation of a very blocky, albeit iconic, silhouette. This model has 16 inch alloy wheels, the designation of which is actually written on the wheel, the edge of the rim, which is common in motorsport, my colleague tells me. This has running boards, which are very solid and do actually make getting in and out a bit easier because it's quite high off the ground. I don't know if you can tell, I'm not very tall, I'm five foot seven and a half. This car is about six foot six. It's quite a tall vehicle, I could not clean the roof on it. There are manual wing mirrors which are quite literally adjusted by physically moving them. There is an exposed fuel filler flap, or, well it's not really a flap, it's more it's something you stick the key straight in and then unlock to remove and you've got very standout wide wheel archers which do add to the muscular look of the car. The windows on this are all very basic, the front ones are hand cranked and the rear ones you squeeze a little catch at the top and then it just slides open like an ice cream van. This model also has the alpine lights like you get on trains on the continent. Oh, um, that's your side repeater. Nothing fancy on the wing mirrors here, just a tiny, tiny light. At the back, the blocky design continues with a very slab-sided rear end. This tow bar is an extra, but this part here is quite literally the back of the chassis. The boot is obviously hinged on the right hand side, opens sideways and it has the spare wheel on it, which means if you're parking on a hill with the car facing down the hill, opening this is going to be a bit of a pig. The handle for it also goes the wrong way and lifts upwards and the rear has got quite a lot of glass on it. The visibility out the back of this is surprisingly good given its size. The separate indicator and brake lights, these are another iconic feature that has been carried on to the new Defender. See, I know some things. And this number plate being offset and over two rows is another classic 
styling feature that really kind of started with this car, right? And JDM vehicles that have the, the one in the centre at the bottom. <laughs> and that's the only time you will ever hear a Land Rover Defender compared to a JDM car. It's also worth noting that the mud flaps on this are behemoths. We believe they may have been replaced because disappointingly they don't say Land Rover on them and we are also missing the third bolt that holds the spare wheel on so I shall have to be careful when I drive this. Let's have a look inside! Because this is quite an old car and was built before the turn of the century it comes with numerous keys to actually gain access to the vehicle. There is one which does the exterior locks, there is one that does the ignition, there's a third for this particular model that unlocks the pedal lock because you will need that otherwise it will get stolen, and there's a fourth key for the petrol or diesel in this case cap, as well as a fifth item which is the remote for the immobiliser system. So if I select the appropriate key to get us into the boot, is it that way? that way and then I think it's the other way ah, there you go and then open the boot you will see that the boot opens very wide and this is in fact a six seater because you've got these jump seats on either side of the boot these can be folded up to increase your luggage capacity or drop down and it allows you to carry four passengers back here if you've got people sitting opposite one another back here though they do have to almost interlock their legs to enable them to actually sit reasonably comfortably because the seats are very close together. The seats in the back aren't really what you'd call comfortable, they're functional but you don't really get a great deal of safety either because they are strictly lap belts. Travelling sideways does also make you feel a bit like you're sitting on a tube train although I'm not sure if this would rattle more or the tube train would. As somebody who's five, seven and a half, my head is touching the headlining, so anybody taller than me, you are going to have to either slouch or sit with your head at a funny angle to actually fit back here. Ventilation wise, squeeze and slide these and they open like the windows in the back of a minibus or as mentioned earlier an ice cream van. They do allow quite a lot of ventilation but uh, they're very very much a design of the past and these are particularly stiff. They're also not what you'd call secure. Getting in and out is actually quite easy as there are two grab handles above the rear door and uh, I mean it'll do but it's not exactly comfortable. There are no features back here either, none. It's, it's, it's a boot or passenger space. So with the chairs folded up, that one likes to stay, this, 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 this one doesn't. The opening to get in and out of the Defender is surprisingly small given the size of the vehicle. The doors don't exactly scream quality and uh, the door cards aren't exactly screwed to the doors. The controls are relatively logically laid out. Uh, the only exception I'd say is the handbrake which is in a very odd position and at a very odd kind of angle between the seats. You have to lean forwards quite a lot to operate it unless you're some kind of orangutan. When I said the uh, controls are in the usual places, the ignition is uh, very much not. It's on the left hand side of the steering wheel, so unless you are driving a Porsche or... actually it's on the right hand side in America as well isn't it? Why did they put it on the left? Inside most of the controls are logically laid out with at least the gear stick being in the expected location. There is no space for your entire right arm because you sit so far out towards the edge of the vehicle and the pedals are offset to the right but that is to be expected with a longitudinally mounted engine and I'm assuming the gearbox is actually kind of here. The seats are directly attached to the floor on their runners which uh, means that you've A got a very high floor and B if you are taller than I am and have the seat further back you can kind of rub your calves on this carpet here. 
There is no glove box to speak of. There is, however, a lovely shelf along here, which is the perfect place to store your can of Heinz spring vegetable soup. There is space for a radio, and this one has a lovely aftermarket unit fitted. Um, the vents feed air through this gap, and I mean, it's a very basic interior. This standard center console does appear to have been made by a DT student, but I mean, it's got a decent amount of storage space inside and uh, cup holders, so eat your heart out. If you wanted a Defender that could seat seven and really hated a particular member of your family or friendship group, you could actually get it with three abreast seating in the front with the third center jump seat replacing this center console. Now, while adding an extra seat to the vehicle, that does add quite a lot of discomfort and inconvenience to the process of carrying a seventh passenger, because this person in the front has to contend not only with a large transmission tunnel, but a handbrake and two levers that the driver will require access to on a pretty regular basis. So any time the driver changes gear or adjusts the diffs, they would essentially be feeling this passenger up. Speaking of diffs, as standard you would drive this vehicle in high range with no diffs locked. If you want to do some more serious off-roading however, you can wiggle this lever about and move into your low range and start locking diffs. While I'm here, I'm just going to give an honourable shout out to this gearbox as being one of the worst gearboxes I've ever tried to drive, because there's a lot of play when you are in gear and uh, Finding gears is a bit of a searching exercise as well, although reverse is somewhat easy to get into. Features! Wow, let's talk about features. There are not many. Um, standard wiper controls on the right hand stalk, push on the end of the stalk to squirt jets onto the windscreen. There is only one squirter in the middle of the windshield though. The windscreen wipers on this are rubbish. Indicator stalk on the left hand side. A push of this stalk on the edge would toot the horn, but uh, this it's immobilized. You must have to start it. Ugh. You've got your indicators on the left hand stalk, and a push of the end of this would usually toot the horn, but this one has a separate button routed up on the top of the dashboard. The heater controls are incredibly basic. You've got two levers over here, one to adjust where the airflow goes and the other to adjust the temperature. It is, I don't know if you can tell, quite cold today, and this heater is rammed on full blast, but it's pretty rubbish. Your fan speeds are on the left hand side of the dash cluster and your headlight controls are on the side of the steering column with a step for full beams. Windows, as mentioned previously, are manually wound up and down. Your rear wiper controls are in the centre of the car as well as your headlamp level adjuster. There's a, an ashtray which appears to just pop out the centre hole. <laughs> There's an ashtray or coin holder, in this case, that's uh, just kind of dropped in the top of the dashboard, so it's easy to empty. There we go. British engineering. The sun visors are a decent size and the rear view mirror is set quite low on the windscreen. This model also has a sunroof and I have been dripped on several times due to a slight leak that it appears to have. Shall we start it up and go for a drive? Yeah, let's do that. At this point we found somewhere suitably windy, beautiful and off-roady in order to enable us to test if the Defender really was as capable over the rough stuff as it is famed to be. The surface was a little bit worse than standard tarmac roads and the defender definitely coped and was more than capable with the terrain that we threw at it doing the off-roading thing my thumb's not inside the wheel 
Harry also confirmed that the defender was capable and in the process of driving through a puddle while I was getting a very good shot, uh, soaked me with freezing cold muddy water. Cheers Harry. Satisfied the defender could off-road, we took a thumbnail for the video and then proceeded to drive back while I filmed my piece to camera. And uh, it did begin to get a little bit dark, so apologies for the upcoming grainy footage. Off we go! So, driving the Defender. It's, uh... It's... Genuinely, I'm slightly surprised that it's not worse to drive than it is. Um... The engine is actually, it feels surprisingly powerful and I suspect that's due to the healthy amount of torque that the two and a half litre diesel that this has produces. Um, it's not refined, I'm not going to lie to you at all. It's very, very agricultural and handling wise, I can feel every bump in the road because it's very firmly sprung and um, it, you, you follow the road as a result and because you sit quite high up you find yourself almost leaning quite a lot with the road but it's not horrendous actually I'm somewhat pleasantly surprised at how adept this is to drive it's not dreadful first gear really is a bit of a crawler gear even when the engine starts to boost he says setting off in second um, first gear really is a slow gear second even you know you can get a bit a bit of movement behind you but you really need to be in third or fourth before you can start actually making progress this does not accelerate quickly to 60. The 0-60 to time for defenders of this era is somewhere in the region of 16 seconds. So you are not going to be winning any kind of speed races in this. However, for what it's designed for, it's actually surprisingly good. I am driving on roads that are, well, as you can probably tell, a little bit snowy but I am incredibly confident in this vehicle that I will just be able to keep going. The, the engine is surprisingly responsive, uh, especially for quite a big, old, agricultural diesel power plant. The gearbox and the clutch are the weak point of the driving experience mainly because the gearbox you do find yourself searching for gears a lot and then the clutch has about that much pedal travel and the entirety of the biting point happens in that top section of travel so most of the clutch's pedal travel is absolutely pointless sitting up this high you can see incredibly well around you and because this is the uh, the model that has rear windows instead of being the panel van visibility to the rear is excellent it's a lot better than most modern cars i've driven because the pillars are so so thin the steering is surprisingly accurate there is a little bit of on center play as you'd pretty much expect with a car of this type and age but generally actually when you turn the wheel and point the car in a direction it does follow you pretty well at this point harry suggested i turn on the interior light to allow a little bit more light into the cameras that is a very good idea yeah it doesn't work ah well old electrics never last do they 
Now, the driving position is dreadful. I'm, <laughs> I'm not comfortable at all. There's no adjustment in the steering wheel at all, and I am very much pinned in against this door, so my right shoulder does kind of hurt a little bit because of how I've been holding the wheel and because I can't put it where I, I want to to remain comfortable. Um, the gear stick is actually in a surprisingly decent location with respect to the steering wheel, so reaching for it isn't too difficult at all. Uh, fourth gear, however, does not like being found. Um, but the ergonomics of this car are very much one of its weak points. inspiring drive at higher speeds I must must tell you 55 feels more than enough more than enough also the positioning of the accelerator is weirdly offset in comparison to the brake and clutch and while I'm at it the brake and clutch are also too high from the floor pan of the car they're, they're, they're too high up and the accelerator's too far down and it's also quite a bit further over to the right than I would have thought it would be. It's not a great driving experience. It is not refined in the slightest. I'm now sitting in traffic behind an Audi Q3 and, you know, the Audi Q3 is a relatively small crossover but I am towering above it. Absolutely towering. Yeah, that handbrake takes some getting used to. Takes a lot of getting used to. It's all very clunky and creaky, this. It's 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 a heavy experience. The clutch is incredibly heavy. Uh, the brakes, the, there's a lot of resistance in the pedal and they don't seem to be that effective as you push it. Uh, the accelerator is probably the only pedal that's what I deem light, but that's light in comparison with the other pedals. It's set, the accelerator does still provide quite a lot of resistance as you push it and I'm wearing hiking boots I would never normally wear hiking boots to drive but I knew that the controls in this were going to be heavy and whether you're wearing plimsolls or absolute kind of heavy agricultural farm boots you're going to be stomping on these pedals just because of how the car is and how the controls feel so really it doesn't matter what shoes you wear you're just going to need to have a heavy foot to operate things in this car but actually surprisingly the engine rev matches very well and i cannot complain at all about visibility the mirrors are pretty crap though. Yeah, the, the, the mirrors aren't... The rear view is okay, depending on where you position it and how you look. Wing mirrors, not great. The turning circle of the Defender can be summarised as pretty horrendous. And the noises I make here summarise the rest of the driving experience. Made it! Oh, creak, creak. Do you want to park and point your headlights at the car? And we can film a quick conclusion, maybe. Welcome back to a slightly different buckle up conclusion because it's winter, so it's now dark. Um, 
I've had a look around the Defender, I've taken the Defender for a drive, I've done a tiny bit of off-roading in the Defender. Can I see why people would spend upwards of £10,000 and sometimes upwards of £20,000 on a car like this? No. For me personally, the Defender is not my kind of thing. Granted, I have had fun today, but it is not the kind of car I would want to daily drive. That being said, it is incredibly competent off-road and surprisingly good on-road. It's not a refined driving experience by any stretch of the imagination, but really, it's not horrendous. The controls were heavy, but the visibility was excellent. The sense of confidence you gain from driving a car like this, that you, are, you just know you, you won't get stuck you will be able to keep going whatever the conditions are like. That is quite a nice feeling. So as a kind of winter beater, yeah, Defender would be great, but not for £10,000. You've really got to love the Defender lifestyle and the Defender brand to want to drive one of these every day. But for the few who enjoy this kind of vehicle and like the capabilities and the experience that it brings, yeah, I can s totally see why you'd want to daily drive something like this. I still don't think they're worth more than £10,000 though. That concludes this video, so thank you very much for watching. If you aren't already subscribed to the Buckle Up channel, please do so. Hit that bell icon so you get a notification every time we post a new video. Check us out on social media, all of our links are in the description. We also have a Patreon and a merch store. I am actually wearing some merch today, but it's under two jumpers and a coat. Uh, it, says, it says Buckle Up on it. Um, we have a range of different shirts, mugs, hats, bags available on our merch store, so please go and check it out if you'd like to give something back to the channel and get something in return. Thank you very much for watching. Bye. I'm really cold. <sighs>